Your word is a lamp to my feet, Lord. Your word is a light to my path. Though the world around me tosses and tumbles, I hold fast to you. Though I have doubts and worries and I wonder, I hold fast to you. Though my heart hurts, my spirit aches, and I lose my way, I hold fast to you. Though I encounter wickedness and hate, seemingly around every corner, I hold fast to you. Your stories and your songs, O Lord, they comfort me. Your will and your way, O Lord, they nudge me along. Your presence and your promise, O Lord, they give me hope. Your world is my heritage and my heart. And I will turn toward you forever. I will hold fast to you. And, and I, I will sing, sing praises, praises to your, your name. This has been a really strange year for everybody, and that includes our young people. Around the end of term, we often encourage some of them who are part of our church family just to let us know what they've been up to and what they're looking forward to for the next year. It's always great to hear their news, and it's really good to pray for them as they find their way through some very unusual challenges. You're going to hear some stories about disrupted schools, uh, apprenticeships and university courses, but hold on for some really good news too. This is the end of term time of year, so here we go. Hi, it's Nadia, Phil and Christina's daughter, and currently I am living in Illinois in the USA. What I've been doing now, so um, for the last month and a half, I've been living with mum and dad um, back here in Stenning uh, after finishing my exams, which are all online, which was a bit weird, but they seem to go okay. For the last three years, I've been studying natural sciences at Churchill College, Cambridge, and in the last year, I specialised in astrophysics. I graduated. I finished my last placement in the middle of lockdown, which meant I was making learning packs and phoning parents to see how they could best support their children at home. Um, I've moved back home, living with the family, um, which has been great, mostly. Um, so what am I up to at the moment? Well, currently I'm furloughed, but it's allowed me to have a lovely amount of time out in the sunshine, go on bike rides, go to the beach, and just really have fun and not take my time off work for granted. Um, so during lockdown for the most part I've been working with Karis at a garden centre warehouse uh, picking pots and garden bits of orders which has been quite good just keeping us out of trouble something new to try um, keeping us busy for lockdown Right now I am a first year student at the College of DuPage and I am focusing in film um, I also accepted my first teaching job it was a hard process because I couldn't look around the school or meet the staff or children and it was all over Zoom and it's very stressful but um, I'm very excited to get started. Um, I've been fellow for my apprenticeship in building services engineering. I've also just completed my first year of university and my third year of my apprenticeship. Um, I've got a few more bits of uni just to finish up but apart from that I've been um, relaxing, taking some time off, playing guitar give myself a home quarantine haircut as you can tell. I do feel incredibly blessed to live here and I really can't wait for the adventures ahead of me. Because of the lockdown I've been home since March and I did my exams online. My A level results which were on the 13th of August this year. Uh, which is quite an exciting thing to think about. I'm um, also very nervous about it. Um, so I've got a little bit less control over what I get, um, but it should all be fine. I'm, I'm very hopeful for it. My ideal plan for next year is to do more exploring of the US. Since it's so vast, I feel like there's so much I haven't seen, and especially I want to make it up to the mountain. There are 22 different languages in my school, which is right up my street. Um, it's a very um, deprived area and there's a lot of emotional needs. And then what I'm hoping for the next year to bring? Well, I hope new challenges at work, something interesting, I'm able to learn lots. I'm also hoping that I'll complete my second year of university and pass that easily. My plan is to apply for a degree apprenticeship where I'll be working as a policeman 
um, as well as doing a policing degree on the side for a three year course, uh, which will all be covered by the police force I'll be with. So I really can't wait to do more exploring next year and also explore the culture and meet new people along the way. And I guess I'm also hoping that I can go on holiday and go abroad to a nice sunny location for my summer holiday next year. The uh, main kind of thing I'm thinking about and praying about at the moment is which police force to apply to. Um, so either the Sussex Police, um, where I can stay at home for maybe a year or so, save up a bit and then venture out on my own. Um, or to Hampshire Police, where I'll be near Tom and Cag, um, kind of go on my own from the get-go. Um, be a bit more exciting, but also a bit more nervy <laughs> as well. So that's my main kind of issue at the moment. I'm really enjoying the subject and I'll go back for a fourth year next year. Cambridge are hoping to have students back with online lectures but small group teaching in person. After that I'm not sure what I want to do but I'll probably apply for a PhD at Cambridge or elsewhere. Um, and as of Monday just gone I am working at Donify full time so working with Robin and Lindsay which I now have to refer to them by and um, Mike Diddemore is also working there, who I'm sure you all know, and a few others, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that for the future. So it'd be great if you could be praying for me, and I'd have the right words to say, and I'd be able to create a really safe, welcoming classroom environment, um, and have a great year ahead. So, living Jesus, we want to pray for Gary, Nadia, Alex, Owen, Adam and Karis, thanking you for who they are and praying the blessing of your Holy Spirit over them. Alongside them, Lord God, we pray for the many young people around our church family, some a bit older, some a bit younger, who they represent. In all that they face, will you give them wisdom, courage and confidence? Will you encourage, empower and inspire them? We pray, Lord, for their families. We pray for wisdom in friendships and developing relationships in their lives. We pray that you will grow their faith. Lord, will you bring around them in family and friends positive voices which affirm your love for them and your presence in their lives. Give them a desire to walk with you. And as they do, may they experience your love, your grace and the presence of your Holy Spirit in their lives. And Lord, for the rest of us, give us a burden to pray for all our young people, to set the right example before them and to be ready to walk alongside them and encourage them to walk with you. Father, we thank you again for our young people. Bless them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that this will be a good year for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father 
and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognise him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Acts chapter 29. Okay, so there isn't an Acts chapter 29. It finishes at chapter 28. Or does it? Doesn't the idea of Acts 29 give us some space to think about what happens next? Not so much for the early church, but for our lives. Doesn't the idea of Acts 29 give us room to think after all the activity of the Holy Spirit working in and through the saints from Acts chapter 1 through to 28, how do we see the Holy Spirit moving in our day, in our time and in our culture? And one of the questions that ruminates around my mind, and this feeds right into the idea of Acts 29, and you've heard me ask this for 10 years now, is if we started again, what would it look like? And, and of course, the heart of that question is how much of what we are and what we do as a church community have we inherited? How much can we challenge or how much have we just drifted into? Before we came here, we were working as church planters in Ecuador. And one of the great things about new churches is they don't have a, this is the way we do things. There is no handed down tradition or culture. You get to choose how things go, at least in the first instant, before that dreaded, this is the way we do things, settles in. But this COVID crisis affords us now, this moment, perhaps like we've never had before and probably would never have again, to hold things back long enough for us to ask, if we were to start again, what things would stay and what things would fall away? And that in the first instance sounds threatening, but it doesn't have to be. It's a genuine thinking that the, the Lord has gifted this Acts 29 moment to us. And we need to ask, what is the Spirit asking us to do and be? So that's what we're asking, and that's how we're praying. And it's the responsibility of every generation to reimagine the gospel for its own time. But the trouble is that often that tradition that's been passed down is strong, and it's a brave thing to challenge or question the way we do things, because it fills up with threatening our very existence. And so we don't ever get a chance to rethink how we operate. But actually, everything in our life changes. Just imagine telling your parents or your grandparents about the wonders of the World Wide Web or, or, or the technology that you, your car has or the places that you've visited that your, your family your, your, uh, in the past could only have imagined. Or imagine the changes we've seen in, in medicine and education or how much more multicultural our country is or, or secular it's become or how fashions have changed. But all through Acts, we see this challenge is happening too. The Spirit is calling the saints to question who they are and what they do and what they consider to be true and right and what they had previously called 
normal. And it requires faith, and faith always requires courage, and it always requires imagination. Last week we started thinking about some of the themes that emerged from Acts that draw our attention for this easing of lockdown time. And we started by thinking about re-Jesusing the church, allowing the call of Jesus to take front stage of all that we do as a church, to organise our personal lives and our common life around the call to know Jesus for each one of us and to structure our activity as a charity, as a church, around the values of Jesus. Lindsay made this beautiful image last week, which illustrates this wonderfully. Jesus in the centre, re-Jesusing our lives. They're themes that inform all that we do as a church family. And in September, we're going to be looking at some of those values of Jesus, the Beatitudes. We call it being happy in an unhappy world. The, the age of Christendom, that rule where the church had the privilege where people generally understood the good news of Jesus, that age is coming to an end. 1500 years of Western European history where Christianity has been the dominant worldview, that's changing. And so to look back about how our parents and our grandparents and even our great grandparents, how they modeled the church is not gonna help us because our culture has become more secular than they could have imagined and, and less dominated by a Christian worldview. But if we look right back to the first century, we see that as they start off, the first Christians are also faced with monumental change and a dominant secular worldview, not dissimilar to what we face today. And so briefly, I want to highlight just two of the themes in Acts which deserve our attention. And over August, I'd like to ask you to pray with us as the leaders are praying and to think as the leaders are thinking about how we respond to these themes in our time and how we work them out in the re-Jesusing of our church. But putting Jesus in the centre not our faith in the centre, not our church in the centre, not our service or the hub or the community in the centre, but the Lordship of Christ. The first one is the priority of Christian discipleship, that even those who trust and believe in Jesus are themselves taken deeper into relationship with him, but they become more Christ-like. It's not that once you first believe, well, that's the end, but the opposite. Once you start believing, that's when the fun starts. That's when the transformation comes to the whole of our lives. The newness of life in Jesus' name is it, it, promised to us. It's not a course. It's not a study. It's a developing relationship with King Jesus. And that, that relationship, little by little, brings transformation to every area of our lives. And it never stops. It never stops. We keep keep growing in grace. We keep learning to risk and be generous and trust the promises of God. We need to seriously consider the priority of, of discipleship in our lives. And the second thing, it jumps out of that, is that mission and ministry come out of our common life. We see in Acts this lovely sense in which Jesus is present by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has her way in the life of the believers in their normal everyday lives. Sure there's a strategy, especially with Paul towards the end of Acts, but even that, it goes to normal places, in normal relationships, in normal situations, in normal routines, and the, the Holy Spirit transforms those to be ministry and mission opportunities. The, the, the travelling, the, the marketplace, the synagogue lives, the meals, the normalness of life is transformed by the Holy Spirit's power and God's kingdom comes close. So, so there isn't one pattern in Acts about how and when we should do church. There's nothing about the day-to-day -day running of the church that we can particularly pick out. But we are invited to take part in the journey to become Acts chapter 29. And I wonder if we can have the courage to hold back those concerns about how we meet and when we meet and whether we're wearing face masks and all those understandable practical questions. 
and to home in on these re-Jesusing principles. The Lordship of Jesus has to impact my life and have a continuing impact on my life. And our common life about serving and witnessing to others and how Jesus longs to bring wholeness and healing and freedom and purpose into other people's lives. Only then can we think, what do we need to do as a church to fulfill these principles? How do we work it out? And that's where the fun starts. And that's where Jesus promised that he would give us the Holy Spirit and do even greater works through us, bringing God's kingdom close. Here we stand at a crossroads again. Like you said, in time the seasons change. Looking back we recall the blessing and the pain. But now we turn our hearts towards what is still to come. We want to dream again. Lead us, Lord, into a life of fruitfulness. Prepare our hearts to risk again. And as we trust, taking simple steps of obedience, we know that you will lead us, Lord. Amen.
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.